Young. I'm the managing director of APT, going into week number six now, so brand new. Um, I am super excited to have James Ridge and David Daniel with me to talk about the rivals today. When, um, when we were making our assignments of who, usually Carrie Cannon sits in this chair, but she's been in Utah all week seeing plays at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. And so she's taken a couple days off, and when we talked about, you know, who gets to do this interview, I was like, me, me, I'll do it, I'll do it. Because I knew it would be easy because these guys will talk, or at least David will. <laughs> I don't know about Jim. Anyway, um, Jim Ridge is here for his 25th season this year. <laughs> and he's playing uh, Lucius O'Trigger in The Rivals, along with Holla Furness in Love's Labor's Lost, who's seen loves labors already. Okay, quite a few of you. Um, and David Daniel is playing Anthony Absolute in The Rivals, and he is playing the ghost in Hamlet, and uh, Nathaniel Holofernes' sidekick in Love's Labor's Lost. These guys are a fun pair. We won't talk about the jello today, though. <laughs> That's a different talk. Um, and David, how many years? Just like over, like over 20, but you haven't quite uh, Mr. Ridge is 23 ahead. for me. 23 for David, right? So, um, uh, yeah, who, who's seen The Rivals already? And who, oh, not so many. So we won't give away any spoilers. Who's seeing it this afternoon, we hope? Very good. All right, excellent. Um, so uh, let's just start with the, at the beginning. I would love to hear you two talk about, I always am interested in, the story of how you came to a play, how uh, how you, not came to see a play, but how you came to be in this play. And also, um, uh, I know that, I think that this started with, there was a reading. Was it last year or was it the year before? Um, were you read the play? Were you both in there? Was, no, no. I, w I was, but that okay. was last year. We started okay. that. Yep. Well, let's talk about that and how, y how you came to the play. I'm going to give this to Jim Rich now. Uh, so uh, last year, Aaron, who is our director, uh, got together, and this is not unusual for the plays that we do out here, but we got together and we did a reading. So we asked some of the actors available, not casting the play, and just getting together and reading it so that he could hear it with a playwright's ear. And that's, way, that's the way Aaron works a lot, is through his ear, not through his eye when he's writing. And so he wanted to hear it, and we did the whole play uncut, which is a very lengthy play, even when the play was first produced, seven 1775, 1775, when the play was first produced, people said, wow, that's a long play. So even way back then, it's had a, it's had a history for its length. Uh, fascinating play, actually. Really great history. But anyway, so Aaron heard it, and there were a lot of things where like, oh, we'll never say that on stage in the world today, so we're going to cut that section out. And, wow, the women in this kind of do this, and they say a little bit this. So he got to hear all of that and then talk to the actors in the room about what they liked and what they didn't like. A lot came from the women in the reading who were like, this is really great. I understand this. I'm a classical actor. I say a lot of things that we don't say today. But this, we don't want to say this. We don't want to say this. Says a woman who says a lot of things that, you know, she, we don't say today. She was, they were like, mm, this got to be cut, this got to be cut, and oh, this is really great, we should heighten this. So he got to hear it, and he started working on it that way. So he started working on it a year, adapting the play, changing it. When I say adapting and changing, I don't mean rewriting the plot or anything like that, but knowing that some scenes needed to be trimmed, some scenes needed to be cut out. So that's where that started, about a year ago in a conversation. Uh, I got a call uh, <laughs> about my casting uh, sometime in the winter, and that's really, that's really, really the first time I ran into the play. Uh, I've not seen the play before. Uh, I wasn't there for the reading of it, um, so really I caught up to it on the first day of rehearsal, um, seeing what what Aaron had in mind for it, what some of its ideas were, and some of the cuttings for it. Um, uh, Aaron, one of, the, one of the clearest things I could say about Aaron Posner, the director, is his sense of humor is still like in seventh grade. 
when he and his buddies would go, oh, that's so stupid. That's when he knows that's what he likes. So that's a lot of where he started then once he got some of the politics and, and uh, the names and, and some of the things. Uh, our co, our colleague, Laura Rook, who's been out here a lot, um, playing women in, in roles that Dee Dee was talking about, says, um, a lot of times I'm either or both crying or dying. <laughs> so when we can come to a play and a, and a director is, is thinking um, about shifting things around, much of the time what they're looking for, what Dee Dee was alluding to, is giving the women a little more agency, making them feel more like uh, human beings rather than just chess pieces in uh, playwright's narrative. And that, I mean, that goes for a lot of the characters, regardless of the gender. I, I, I love, I love plays. I love reading about plays and knowing their history. And one of my favorite stories is the first actor that played Lucius O'Trigger. <laughs> they were doing it at Covent Garden, and it was so awful that people started booing, and somebody threw an apple or tomato at him, hit him right in the face, and he stopped the show and he said, "All right, all right." By all the powers that be, by God, is this personal or is it the play? Which one is it? <laughs> no, no joke. Uh, uh, Sheridan went on because we're, we're talking about how we perceive these roles and the changes that we make. And Sheridan himself offered an apology. He said, because Lucius O'Trigger is Irish. And he said, I want to make sure that everyone knows I am not making fun of the Irish. Lucius O'Trigger is a particular Irishman. And so he offered an apology as the writer. It was his first play. And he offered this apology, and they rewrote it and recast the role. <laughs> and then it went on to acclaim. It became, the, it became uh, the, like the royals asked for it over and over and over again. So it was an utter failure opening night. And he rewrote it with some of these ideas of changing some of the roles. And... Instant success. So you were talking about the seventh grade humor and, and, uh, and rewriting the play. Aaron, in his director's notes, talks about uh, The Rivals as a sitcom. And um, he says a few things about it being a sitcom. But like it's true. The Rivals is just like delight from start to finish. And um, I'm wondering if you can talk about, in, and, and what we he what I've heard a lot is, Oh, you know, actors need to like after post pandemic everybody's sort of reexamining their work in the world and what they're bringing to the world and and artists of course do that maybe more than <laughs> regular non-artist people. So, being in this just pure or maybe not just pure delightful show. How do you feel about that or have you did you talk about that? Did you wrestle with that at all? Uh, okay. Uh, ooh. Sorry. Um, um, I guess how I would frame an answer to that is the pandemic was difficult for everyone, and uh, artists, theater artists, felt it very keenly when. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 38 years or so. It's really the only real job I've had as an adult. And it was gone. There was none of it. And for a while, it looked like, I don't know if this is ever coming back. And <clears throat> in, as a person in my late 50s, suddenly I was wrestling with, what else can I do in the world? And I came up with the answer, nothing. <laughs> uh, disheartening uh, after having paid for college. But um, so here's the change that happened coming, coming through wrestling with that is that I used to take great delight in pulling my heart out for the audience to examine. Like I felt like my job was to feel everything in front of people who maybe don't feel that way every day. And and I love that. And now I'm really happy to make people laugh. Um, there's, a, there's something really, again, having experienced a sort of vacuum 
trying to do plays on Zoom and then coming back and doing them for houses where people are sitting, you know, six seats apart and and to come up the hill on an evening and have over a thousand people in the seats and to hear that communal laugh, oh, that's good for the soul. Um, so I'm really, really happy to be in two comedies this year. It's been kind of restoring for me personally. Yep. I'll just say too, I, I as an audience member, uh, being in that space and experiencing that laughter, that's 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 life changing for us too. We talk about um uh, uh I was talking to the board of directors and talking about how, you know, we're changing lives and uh and I'm not being hyperbolic and, and it's easier to see that, you know, sort of make that connection with uh the brother's size. If any of you've seen the brother's size, it's a very important, one beautiful play. But really this is just as important is is spreading that joy to um, to our audience. So thank you both for doing that so well, really. Um, okay, I have to look at my notes. Okay, so um, <laughs> so I, I'm so I'm curious. What um, one thing that strikes me about the rivals is y there's a lot of you. There are definitely there are some wonderful uh, new to us actors in the play but also a good handful of y'all that have worked together for a long, long time. And um, can you just talk about the, uh, what that brings or doesn't bring and um, sort of what skills, what muscles you're particularly flexing with each other in this play? Uh, okay. <clears throat> so uh, 23 years ago, uh, I, I was hired to do Demetrius in Midsummer, and we did our first reading over at the Taliesin, what's the official name of that place? You know what? Wintergreen, Wintergreen, beautiful setup. And it was my first, I had auditioned at APT for three years, didn't get in, didn't get in, didn't get in. Finally, they were like, stop, stop. Okay, all right. Um, and I was walking up, and Dead Staples was there, Mark was, Corky was there, Jonathan was like all these like titans of the stage. And I was so like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's APT, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. We're in this beautiful room, the tables were there, all the scripts were laid out, and everybody, we're just going to read through and talk through the play, just get to know this play, what questions we have. And I just felt like, I have to prove myself. I have to let them know that I'm the guy for the outdoor theater. And it's, an, it, you know, it's, it's, it's inside with walls and a ceiling. You don't want to be too loud. And I was loud. First line, my lord! Ar, ar, ar. I mean, I think everybody in the room, I had this feeling everybody in the room was like, whoa, whoa. And uh, Jim Ridge was playing Puck at the time. And uh, at one point in the play later on, Puck disguises his voice as Demetrius. And I remember I was sitting there, and then, you know, Demetrius, call, the disguised voice of Demetrius calls out to Lysander. And I remember I was sitting there, and we are doing the thing, doing the thing. And I was like, okay, I think I got it. I think I'm doing good. And then this guy playing Puck said, Lysander, go to the woods. I was like, who the hell is that jerkwad over there? <laughs> and over the years, what, what has happened, what builds up with a core company like this is a trust, is a trust that you can be bad which is so important. It's so important. I know that you, I know that some of you think that we just walk out there and it's magic. Like something just happens because we are incredible people. We are not. We are not. We're terrible, awful people. Just like you. <laughs> and, and it takes a lot of stumbling around in the dark and putting your hands out, and sometimes you're poking the other person in the eye. It is a lot of just trying to figure things out. And that's hard to do if you're worried about what everybody's thinking and what everybody's making up about you. Oh, I have to, now I have a couple. Now I have so many more questions. Um, so... Um, how do you, so if you all have so much trust with each other, you're not all core company in this company. So how does that, how do you, how does that work for the people that are new to the room? Um, 
how and I don't know if you can totally answer that, but how do you how does how does that feel for them and how do you as veterans make allowances for that? Oh um Boy, in life, all you can really do is make the bid or the invitation to be vulnerable, to be courageous. Um, and, you know, there, there are certain times when if... Here's what I do know is that we all have our eyes out because we know what it's like to walk into a room with 25, 30 years of, of experience with each other. That's a, it's a really tight-knit group. We have a vocabulary, a shortcut for the way we work. And, so, and we know that. So we always have our eye out for someone who might be struggling a little bit. And it's part of our job as core company. We've been tasked with it specifically to come alongside and, and encourage and, and help bear the load and say, I really like what's going on. Um, we all feel like that some days, you know, just just try to share whatever your own personality is with to to really encourage them to be part of the team. And and over and over again through the years I've said, You're here. So you you did the part where you had to try to prove yourself. You got the job. Here you are in the company. So whatever it is that makes you you, that's the thing that you got hired for. So believe in yourself, bring that, and you're doing your job. Uh, I will, uh, I'll add that it's really important for us as core company members to show our, our failure, to fail openly or publicly in rehearsal, because that will, and it, it's not just once, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to own it, own it, own it, own it publicly, because only that, only by doing that, will it give permission to those other folks to do the same thing. So failing for us publicly and owning it, like taking really bad, making bad choices, and not just getting on with your job because making bad choices and falling on your face is part of our job, but to say it out loud so that those younger folks, those newer folks, less experienced folks, say, oh, okay, if they did it, then I can do it. it it's, it's giving permission for that. And... You know, it goes both ways. Uh, I used to be the early person in the company. And I remember Jonathan and, and Corky, uh, they were, you know, like, wow, what are you coming up with these ideas? It's this and this and this. And now I'm older in the company. When, they, when, the, when the new folks come in, it, and it's not about age, but when new folks come in, it's like, wow, these ideas and, and this energy that you have, this hunger. I can't remember the last time I was that hungry for something. And you're just so want. It's, it's both. It is both sides of that. Uh, new people right out of college or grad school or just from other theaters, they come in. They feed us with so much. We know what we're doing here. We've been doing it for a while. We know what we're doing. We know how a way of doing it. They feed off of us a lot. Like, wow, listen to the way you use that verse line. I didn't know. And oh, I see now. I see how you use your voice to fill that. Oh, I see. like it's a. It, we feed off of each other so much. Um, a couple tech. Did I stop working? No, I'm okay. Okay. Um, uh, not really technical, but uh, more about the design. Um, I would love to talk about the music. Sheridan didn't write the mu write music for this play, right? Um, so um, if either of you know or if, uh, from Aaron's view of why, how, all that, and, and from your point of view, is that fun or is that stressful? <laughs> or both? Okay, I want to see how you answer this because <laughs> I know the truth. So. So every play I've done since the pandemic has singing and dancing in it. <laughs> Straight plays. And I am not a musical theater performer. So yeah, it's a little stressful. Um, uh, the, it, 
it goes back to what Didi's talking about, though, really in terms of failing. Um, so I guess in a positive light, it really offers me opportunity to fail publicly <laughs> for the good of my cast members. I w Jim, Jim is a much better singer than I am, much better. And, uh, you know, he's got this sense of like, okay, I've got it, I've got, we've, because we, we're, not only are we singing, but we're harmonizing, okay? So we have to learn parts, and we're not like all the basses over here, all the tenor, no, it's everybody all mixed up, and you just got to hold your line. To non-musicians, that's like, I don't, I, I just sing the thing that everybody else is singing, right? So Jim is really good at holding that bass line. I am really good at just being loud. I'm really good at that. And so Jim is holding that bass line, and every time I get near him, he just sips a little further away from me. <laughs> Dee Dee's like the musical chameleon. He goes from tenor to bass to alto. Whoever is whatever standing catches, beside me. Whatever catches <laughs> his ear. Oh, I can sing with you. Marcus. Oh, I'll sing with you. Marcus, uh, tenor, Marcus, Marcus, tenor, tenor. So Marcus is singing the tenor line on this side. And because he's really loud, I'm like right there. And then Jim will drop in on the bass and I go, well, I'm now in the bass line over here. <laughs> and then Tracy at the end of the play, she's right beside me. So I'm singing Tracy's part with her. <laughs> you talked with Aaron specifically about the music, didn't you? Or some of those ideas that drove? Uh, yes, yes. So, um, so hmm, what does music do for us? Uh, even in a straight play, there's music. And there is something really beautiful and universal and communal about listening to a piece of music, regardless of your culture or your age. There's just something that we as beings respond to. Have you seen those videos where somebody playing Chopin for an elephant? You know, it's just there's something about that that we respond to. And so there is a reason why music is always in a play. It doesn't matter what kind of music, and we may not like the music that's in it, but there's always movies are made by their soundtracks. And so that goes without saying. There is a strength and a call that's in music. With this one, because of the style of this play, and I'm going to say, I'm going to put the word vaudeville out there. It is not directly vaudeville, which is a style in and of itself, but it is, it is leaning that way. And we use that word a lot when we were talking. And so there are a lot of techniques of vaudeville that we use in the play. Um, the, the kind of music, the fact that we, spoilers, that we all come out and sing before the play starts, lets you know something about this play. You just like, oh, okay, now I'm ready. Because if we started out with Mrs. Thomas, oh, Mrs. Thomas, you would have a very different idea of what this play was about. And it would take us a long time to get you in a place where you were just giggling at everything that happened. With the music, and the music is written for our APT audience specifically, then you just know like, oh, okay, all right. And you're already kind of giggling and smiling before the play, quote unquote, starts. So that's what music does for us. It, it will open the door for us, but in particular, these musical pieces, plural, are reminders uh, and um, flotation devices. They keep us bubbling on the top. They keep us going like, ooh, 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 ooh. That's what, this, that's what these pieces are designed to do. And uh, for those of you who've seen the show, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, just know that, like, ooh, this is intentional to keep you bubbly so that we can add more bubbles. These metaphors are going nowhere. They're going nowhere. I, yeah, it, it's like his, uh, I mean, in the, if it's a sitcom, that you know, every good sitcom's got to have a good, you know, opening theme song. So it's, um, uh, we want to answer your questions if you have any, and we we have been passing the microphone around. We talked about. It. I think we're not going to pass the microphone. Nope, nope, David, no, stay there, and um, and then we'll just repeat your question. So, is anybody? Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to comment on the music. So, for those of you who have not seen it, it is truly delightful. 
and yes, that opening is just wow. Mm -hmm. But and David, I want to let you know though, didn't really pick up on you doing all the different parts. So I am that that's good. good. That's how good I am. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how did you find someone to write music to a play that's from written in seventy? So the question is, how did we find uh, someone to write music from a play that was written in 1775? Either one of you have insight on that? Ooh, uh, same as Love's Labors, which is another period piece with songs in it, yep. Right. So I'm not specific, we are not specifically in on the design process. But that's really where, where a lot of that would have started in terms of finding a time to set the play in for costumes. <coughs> um, that's generally that's where those conversations really, really start in terms of the time period. And then everything else branches off of that, the music, uh, the setting. Um, and boy, I. I would have loved to have been in on the conversations with Dre and Aaron about that, but I'm sure the word stupid came in uh, somewhere. Um, and I, I assume it was Dre's idea as composer that he was the one that sort of landed on barbershop. Um, because there's really, again, like, again, I just said the word and there was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Like it, it, it has a really, there's a certain, touchstone quality about that music and the way the harmonies work. And, and I will say, too, that when we started working on that song, uh, there's a young person here who is the um, assistant director, and they have some, a lot of uh, movement experience, and they were asked to choreograph. And so that was a conversation and a, a collaboration as well in terms of just the right amount of choreography so that you don't take away from the fun of the reaction of Barbershop. And so it, it's really about a bazillion conversations with really smart and creative people that start, that sharpen each other and, and sharpen the focus down into something that seems to work. I just wanted to tag onto that and ask you about um, <clears throat> I, and maybe this influenced the style of music too, but Aaron decided, the play was written in 1775, but Aaron said it in, do we say 1910, the teens? Downton Abbey is what I always think of. Did you talk about that and talk about what you... Right, right. Well, so when we set a play, it has a lot to do with how we will receive it. Uh, if you look at something like Much Ado where the men are coming home from war and the women have been waiting, you know, if you were to do that in kind of any period before, like in the 1800s or before, there's a kind of like, oh, the men are coming back from war. If you said it post-World War II, where the soldiers are coming back from World War II, and then you have Rosie the Riveter on stage, that's a very different conversation between the two genders there. It's just a very different conversation. And that costuming, that time period, will set us, will prime us to what's going on here. And so part of that design process for Aaron and his designers were, what, when do we want to have this conversation about love and what is love? Sheridan wrote it in the 17, 1700s where it was uh, the, the male chooses the love interest who is going to be much younger. There's a dowry involved. And then if she likes it, wow, that's great. And if she doesn't, she will later on. <laughs> so that's a particular conversation. And for Aaron, he thought, he thought that the, that time period of the teens was a new expression, a new opportunity for women to speak voices that hadn't been, that hadn't been had the opportunity before. And there's a difference between what Mrs. Malaprop the older generation thinks is proper, and what the, the two ladies in the young generation think is proper. And then there's the class difference. And when classes are starting to bleed into each other rather than being so like, well, they were born this way and I was born this way. So, so those conversations become much more alive depending on when that era is. Um, and we don't believe that we are damaging the play in any sense. 
I will certainly say that Randy, Randall Duck Kim, would have said, why are you modernizing, quote unquote, modernizing it? And that's a really great conversation. And that's a conversation that directors and di designers have all the time here when they change a period of a play. So those conversations are rich and nuanced, and there's never a right answer about any of that. There's never a right answer. Uh, there's a Right now, the National is doing Captain Jack Absolute, a version of this play, Captain Jack Absolute, and it is in World War II. It is specifically set in World War II, where he's a pilot, and of course, at that time, a pilot in the RAF was an educated man, probably went to Oxford, and so uh, the young woman doesn't want to have anything to do with him, but that mechanic, boy, is he sure down to earth and a really swell guy. So depending on the era, the time period that you see, you can get all kinds of conversations. I will, I will also say, I'll add one more since we're talking about when this play was set. For those of you of a certain age who may remember James Garner's Maverick, <clears throat> The Rivals was a Maverick episode. Oh. Yep, it was a Maverick episode. And uh, it was, so I remember Maverick, I'm watching Maverick, I don't, I didn't watch the whole series. It went on for much longer than I thought it was. But Roger Moore also came in later on to take over the role. Some of you are like, yes, I remember. Yeah, that's, don't admit that in public. But um, they did an episode together. And in that episode, they did The Rivals. It, they rewrote The Rivals to make the episode of The Maverick. It's really cool. I went, when, when, we found, when I found out we were doing this, I did all my research and I watched the episode. It was really crazy. It's really fun. And they rewrote the ladies and gave them kind of Western names, Western, Western American West names. It's a really fun episode. So when you place it, changes a lot of that conversation, what we hear in those words. Um. I think yeah, I I think that that makes sense uh, to give the women more agency. Um, uh, but but neither one of your characters are very nice. They have, you have your moments of being kind of, you know, not so nice to some women. Um, how do you how how's that feel? How do you, like playing an unlikable like you get booed, David, fairly often <laughs> in this play. In Spring Green. In Spring Green. <laughs> Downtown. That was good. That was good. Anyway, thoughts um, on that? Yeah, yeah. I I will say that's that's dangerous for us on our end. It is, it's dangerous for me to try to find a role or make a role because I am subtle and crafty and I can make a role that's awful and still make you like me. It is dangerous for me to do that because we need to know that there are really awful people out there. That there are awful people or people who are opinionated. That's why not all of us love going back to family reunions or going to Thanksgiving. That's why we're like, yay, Thanksgiving! And we're like, oh, God, is he going to be there again? I don't want to. Don't get him started on that conversation. You know, like, we don't have to be liked. And it's really, I will say this, it's really dangerous because we're talking about the conversation of women. It's really dangerous for women as well because we don't want something that's called a Mary Sue and a Mary Sue is the perfect person, a person who's got it all together, a person that life's challenges come at them, and they're like, okay, well, here's how I'll handle it. And it's like, you know, that's wonderful that we have hope and we can reach out to something greater and say, you know, in my struggle, oh, that's a possibility for me. But if we lose touch with it and just think, like, everything is easy for that person, we lose touch with the play. We have to see struggle. We have to see the blemishes and the marks and the bruises and the wisdom has to come from experience. So it is it is okay for me to play, because, you know, we're talking about a misogynist who, I don't know if it's misogynist or not, because he's their champion later on, but it, it we need to know that that is in the world, that it was in the world, is in the world, maybe will be there tomorrow, but, like, we just need to know that that's one of the colors of life for us. So I don't, I don't because, you know, we're also talking racists. We're talking racism. We're talking uh, religious bigotry. We're talking about any kind of, like, that's not so convenient. Those are things that we have to be careful about. If we remove, if we remove too many of them, then we're just kind of making everything easy about the play. Now, I don't know how Jim, Jim feels about that because, I you know, he plays bad people. I've seen him play bad people. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a delicate conversation. Jim, delicate. you have anything to add? 
Um, for me, it always comes down to what does the character want. And so it's, it's my job to pursue what my character wants in the world of the play uh, without judgment, unless the playwright has conveniently written some you know, epiphany for my character to understand. Um, I think I'm always kind of looking for that. So like doing Richard III, late in the play, Richard sees the ghosts of the peoples he's murdered or had murdered. And um, if it's me on that journey, I take that scene and turn it into a place where life really drops in and someone who seems to have a seared or hardened conscience is all of a sudden made a little more human in front of us, not necessarily redeemed or becomes a different person. Um, so I think, I think the truthfulness of what the playwright has written is really, really the main, my main calling. And more and more, as I've done this longer and longer, if I go to see a play, if I feel like at the end of the night I've met the playwright, then I feel like congratulations are in order. And if the talk about time period or this or that or whatever it is that, that's in that collaboration, if I feel like I'm, I didn't get to meet the playwright, then I feel a little cheated. So that's the thing for me. I'm gonna, really let, me, let me I'm gonna add something, because we had this along these lines about what that play, what the character is after and what they come to and how, because it's ultimately not about the character, of course, it's about the play, and it's not even about the play, it's about you. I mean, that's what we're here for, is you. So we had a conversation in Love's Labors where we were trying to, we have two kind of stock characters. We have two stock characters that don't develop, they don't go anywhere. And Jim and I were, you know, we, it's easy for us at this point in our careers to kind of do a stock character and make everybody very happy with it. But we're not happy with it, because it's a stock character. And so, I remember it, it one time we were like, you know, it's the struggling, it's the struggle we don't know, and then let's try this. I came up with one of those crazy ideas. Let's try this. And we did, and it gave an end to their journey, one that is not written by Shakespeare, not written by Shakespeare, but is absolutely part of the world of the play that we had created and only came to be because we had created this particular world. So, yes, sometimes it is written by that, playwright very clearly that sometimes it's hidden it's hidden inside the play and we can find it as the actors and sometimes the actors are just like you know what here's an opportunity to find a new story here that's still part of this world it, there are all kinds of ways of getting at that yeah good thank you thank you for that that's maybe we have a little oh never mind um we have time we're just about out of time but we have one one more question yeah back there you could share with us some of the kinds of lines that uh, the director and maybe some of the women involved decided they just can't say that uh, in a play today. Oh, yeah, if you can say them in mixed company. I know there was a, there was a character name that got changed. Yep. Uh, I'm trying to think of um, Julia's last lines. Let me, let me see oh. if I can get to those. <laughs> can you... Tread water while I'm thinking of that, or do you want me to tread while you're thinking of the Julia line? I, oh, there's not a chance I'm going to come up with those lines. Um, hmm. uh, so the character name was the one of the servants uh, Sheridan named, which is the name for uh, in more like around the turn of the century uh, for a cigarette or a small light that you would use to light a fire, F-A-G. And so uh, Aaron just changed it to F-I-G, uh, which has the same, and this is the smart thing coming up from a playwright's mind, is that it has the same consonants, so it does the same thing in our ear. Um, just doesn't, we just don't even go there. The, the audience, their mind, their spirit, doesn't even have to touch on that. 
Uh, I can't, I can't uh, recall the uh, the initial dialogue, but here's what it, Sheridan. So it's it's uh, public domain, and you can look it up and find uh, Gutenberg's probably got it, um, but you can find readily accessible copies of this. But at the end of the play, not only is it long, which Sheridan admitted, and his audience is also like, well, that's a really long play. So not only was it long, and Aaron's like, I have to trim this out, but it was problematic in that. This woman that we had seen fighting for her own identity, who in the play is, I think, maybe 14, 15? How do you feel, Julia? Is She's young. She's young. And in our play, she's 20-ish, you know, which changes everything. He's a young man, officer, probably in his 20s. And we just don't like, oh, the 20-year-old guy with the 15-year-old girl. Yeah. We just don't. That, that's not something for us anymore. And it was of a time. It was of a time, but it is not for us anymore. And so... At the end of the play, her text was along the lines of, I realized what a want, what a stubborn woman I was, and you know, I put my needs ahead of yours, and things like that. And and they ended up together, and he ended up apologizing. So he learned from his mistakes through the play as well. And the young lady playing is like, it's just that's we don't know. No, it can't be that. And Aaron was like, I agree. And I think that Sheridan, this is totally. This is totally up to Sheridan and our, our our director, Aaron. Aaron's like, I think these rewrites, I think Sheridan would get behind if Sheridan was alive today. Because the women that he was writing were, revol- like, sh- like Shakespeare, they were revolutionary of the time, of the time. Today, we look back and go, what? You know, equal pay is like, no- hopefully, is normal, is normal. There was a time when it wasn't, when it wasn't. And so... That, the end of the play, was revolutionary for its time, but rather dated today. And so Aaron and the actress, they went through, Aaron did all the writing, of course, but Aaron rewrote it and shaped it and said, I think I am still being true to this play. I'm still being true to these characters. And so that's the, that's the ending that you'll see today. And if you are curious to compare them, please do look that up because they're, like I said, it's readily available for anyone who's curious. Uh, we are out of time, and I want to just thank you and thank, David and Jim, we had to let them get up to their to their job. But thank you so much for I joining. I think we have a singing us. rehearsal. That's where we're going. Now.
And so over the years of the core company, we get to smell each other's poo. You know, we just know. And it becomes, I know, I know, these are terrible metaphors. I, I remember, I'll give you two, I'll give you two. <laughs> so when we did Pericles, when we did Pericles, which was a whole nother talk in and of itself, but I, we're sitting at the table and the director was like, yeah, just come up with anything you want to do. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm from Virginia. Let me see what happens if I just bring my Virginia in it. So I did. And I remember Jim Rich going, God, like that's where he was going to go. He was going to go to his southern roots. And so he's like, God, there's that. And so he turned into his, your aunt, right? Was it your aunt? That, the female, the, the um, in Pericles, the, uh, the bod. No, Who no. Who was I, that? It was a family member, right? Was, ah. <laughs> so jump forward to the rivals. And we're sitting there, we're sitting at the read-through, we're sitting too. at the first read, and Jim's sitting beside me, I was like, I'm going to try this like I'm 107. And he said, mm, okay. <sighs> and he just goes with it. And that is not the choice we ended up with, but I know that I'm working with a partner, and I know that I'm working in a room where you can be bad. And that's important because you can't be the good thing that everybody expects until you're able to get through all the bad stuff. And so, if nothing else, there is an ultimate trust. When I walk out on stage and as we do more things and more inventive things and our bodies are changing and they're getting a little like, oh, you know, and our voices and our memories, it's nice to know that you're on stage with someone who has you. No matter what happens, they are there for you. And that if you mess up, don't worry, because that person that you have so much faith in is going to be there for you. That makes taking chances and being funny and being crazy, it makes it easy. Because you know that person has got you no matter what happens. Even when you are terrible, they're still like, you're awful. I got you. It's okay. That, specifically this person right here for me, but... Uh, David Daniel is somebody who has more ideas before breakfast than most of us have in the rest of our lives. <laughs> so being in a rehearsal hall with him is is uh, confusing at times. Because like, oh, I looked over here. Now, now where are you? Um, but he uh, he really leads the way that way in terms of being courageous in the rehearsal hall and... Um, that in and of itself is something that that sets the tone for a play like this. When going back to uh, actually my first contact with the play, I remember now Aaron sent out a um, an email before we got into the first day of rehearsal, and he said, "Please, please, please make lots of big, stupid choices." And this guy. <laughs> Took that literally, and uh, but really, really, that sets the that sets the tone for being courageous and silly with each other, and and trying lots of weird things, and and most of the time, if we can crack each other up and ourselves up, then we know we're really on the road to something that's going to work. It, it, it's that that is to say, because we're talking about just the process. That is to that is not to say that there are not times when you are. It, Colleen does this every year. Like I'm going to, I'm I'm leaving. This is my last year. I'm done because I'm terrible. I'm awful. And so I'm sending out my resumes to be a house cleaner because I'm adequate at that, which no one believes other than her. Uh, but it is, it is, it is filled with mountains and valleys. And at every at every time in every show, there will be you walk out there and you're like, this is. I remember with Rivals, I was like, this is just generic. It's so bland. I'm out there. I'm not doing anything. I'm not committed. These words don't mean anything. I feel like I'm just making stuff up. And bleh. I remember that very day, Jim was like, hey, man, I really like where it's going. I like where you're taking it. He's really grounded. I think you've got a nice focus for him. And I was like, really? And here's the thing. If I don't believe me, I will 100% believe him. 
I will 100% believe him. So, like, that just makes that just makes that work much harder. And whether we're talking about rivals, the comedy, or whether we're talking about Lear or the brother size, you need that kind of trust with someone to kind of, you know, show what's on the inside, let out those hurt parts sometimes.